Well, welcome back. Time for our impact interview. And you know, some clubs are tougher to get into than others. National championship winning quarterbacks is a very exclusive one. Our next guest has been a member for over three decades. Former Penn State QB John Schaefer, thanks so much for the time. Tom, Jay, and I are really excited to talk to you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Uh, it's great to see you guys. All right, well, so we call this the impact interview, John, and obviously sports has made a big impact in your life. Not many environments are more competitive than the football field. Wall Street may be one of them. Can you talk about how playing at Penn State helped prepare you for a highly successful career in the Big Apple? Well, I think, uh, I mean, one of the best things about Penn State and one of the reasons why we all went there was uh, you wanted to put yourself in a position to play the best teams uh, and to maybe play for a national championship. Back in the 80s, that happened every four years, or at least we put ourselves in a position. We were lucky enough that my year, we were lucky enough to at least play in two. Uh, the guys a year ahead of me played in three. Uh, so, but, but what really mattered and what was most important to Joe and what was most important to us was what happened after you were gone. And once you left and once you contributed, uh, it's, it's, it's not so much what you did on the field, although that was important. Uh, I think, and one of the reasons why we decided or why I decided to go there was, I think it was, it, it, Joe always said he prepared you for life. And, you know, at 57, 56 years old, I sit here and I still remember what Joe said. I still, you know, preach it. It's still very important in my life. I still uh, appreciate that I had the opportunity to, re to represent the brand of Penn State. Um, so it was a real it was a real privilege and honor to go there to play with the people that we played, uh, you know, working on Wall Street. I, I will tell you, uh, there was a lot of pressure and people think that there's a lot of pressure. There's still I've never faced more pressure in my life. Well, number one, than competing for a quarterback position that I thought I had that I didn't have that I had that I didn't. Have. So that was that was difficult. Uh, and then playing that I, mean, I still think the most pressure I ever felt was two minute offense, you know, in Beaver Stadium in front of a crowd playing a, you know, a, a key opponent and having to take the ball down the field to win. That's probably more pressure, the most pressure uh, I kind of have ever felt. Well, John, you came to Penn State from Cincinnati Mobile High School and uh, obviously led to incredible success. As far as Penn State quarterback Sean Clifford has played, as well as he's played, do you think he would have been even better had he come from Moeller rather than that school you love, St. <laughs> X, Saint X? And all kidding aside, how much does it mean to be part of such a great tradition at Penn State? Well, I, I mean, it's it's been it was great to be a part of, you know, it still surprises me that Penn State um, has won a national championship. Uh, you can call the, the Kerry Collins uh, years as, as, you know, they had a fantastic team and arguably maybe better than than our team, uh, certainly at the quarterback position they were. Um, <laughs> but coming from Moeller, I've said that Moeller prepared me. I mean, there were 27 guys that recruited my senior year in high school. Uh, nine went to Division One, And I like I used to say 23 because I thought that was the stat and I was afraid to lie or exaggerate it. The number was 27. So. Steve Kalani and the Moeller program, it created greatness. We had, we really studied offenses. And I think I, I still look back and, and I remember sitting in the quarterback meeting room when I first was a freshman at Penn State, uh, sitting with Coach Bob, and I knew how to read defenses. I, we had run part of the Penn State offense at Moeller. So coming from Moeller, the preparation of playing in front of 21,000 people, playing in big games, uh, playing with great players, uh, I think really prepared me well once I got to Penn State. Hey, John, you're being way too humble here. I know you only lost one game as a starter your whole career, and it was the national championship game against Oklahoma, so you're being way too kind here. But, hey, Joe Paterno often referenced you as one of the greatest leaders he'd ever coached. In 1986, you were captain of a national championship team. We lost one of your co-captains from that team this past week. Can you talk about Steve Smith and the kind of teammate and player he was for those who don't remember how great he was? Yeah, he, he was, uh, it's very sad news. I think uh, I heard it watching, you know, it was fitting. Matt Millen, at least on the Big Ten Network, that's where I heard it when he broke it in the third quarter. Uh, deepest sympathy to Chi and to, to Dante and Jasmine and, their, and his grandson. Uh, I think he battled, man. I think, frankly, if there was ever a player that embodied what a Penn State player was supposed to be, his contributions, you know, Post his Penn State days, Steve Smith was that guy. He was a stud. He was a he was a tank. He was a player on the field. Um, 
and and he he had a great four year four or five years at Penn State. He had a great nine years in the NFL. It was really really important, and he made his impact. If if the world had stopped then, he would have made his impact. But what he did, and and I think what we had talked about, Joe cared about what, and the Penn State tradition was very much about what you did in your life. And if 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 there was ever a person that checked all of those boxes, if there was ever a person that was a good husband, who was a good dad. Uh, who who had such a difficult curveball thrown at him? He he fought courageously. He set a good example. He he deteriorated physically, but he still smiled. He still laughed. Um, he accepted the challenge of having ALS, and you see it, and you read about you know all of the things that his family talks about now. Um, he accepted it. He worked at trying to beat it. Um, and he tried to survive each day for his wife and for his for his kids. And I, I and and you talk about if if what we're supposed to do is leave something behind. Steve Smith did. He was he was a great football player. He was a fantastic football player. But he was a better example. Uh, and you know, great dad, great husband. John, please hang with us for a minute. We're going to step aside for the TV show and take a break. We will continue our interview with John Schaefer. If you want to see the entire conversation, make sure you go to NittanyGameWeek.com for the full interview along with other web-exclusive content. John, I know you were interviewed for and featured prominently in a re-airing of the national championship game versus Miami now 35 years later. I want to ask you about that 86 championship team in the season, but obviously the Fiesta Bowl stands out. But there's something that people, is there something that people wouldn't know, something that really crystallizes what that climb was like for your group? I think it was just another example of how the offense carried the defense for most of my career. <laughs> <laughs> I teed you up for that. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, exactly. Easy does it. We had 17 yards of total passing yards, uh, and I think maybe I completed more to the other team. But anyway, um, we were prepared for that. Uh, we were pre- pre- prepared for that game, frankly, because I mean we were seven, four, and one my freshman year, six and five my sophomore year. We, you know, lost in the Orange Bowl, undefeated and lost in the Orange Bowl my junior year, but we were in my junior year we won ugly. We had a lot of those fifth year players, Smitty being one of them, Shane Conlon being another. Um, those guys uh, those guys came back our senior year to have a shot at playing for a national championship. And we frankly, you know, we we were prepared for a national championship because of what happened and what went before us. We also had fantastic coaches uh, that put us into a position um, to really be great. We, we, Jim Caldwell came in from an offensive perspective. He changed our scheme to a certain extent, uh, and that really allowed us to, to, do, to be more of a threat offensively. Uh, but I think, I mean, we really loved each other. You, you look at some of the things that were said and in pre- preparation uh, for even the, the interview uh, about the national championship game, um, we really loved one another. We were, we never, ever, ever thought that we would ever go on the field and lose a football game. And that's because we didn't. We just didn't. And if it was time for Shane Collin to step up or DJ Dozier to step up or Dave Clark or Steve Smith, we just did. And, and it, was, it was that, frankly, that I think as, as much as the preparation for the game was important, we went into that game, you know, nervous. I was. But I think we thought we were, we were going to win. Even at the end, we thought we were going to win the game. So I think it was our preparation. But it was four years in the making. It was a great team. And it was a lot of love and great teammates that allowed us to, 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 to accomplish that. Well, everyone talks about the 86 team. I want to take you back to the 85 season. Coming off two bad losses to finish the 84 season, uh, 85 team really kind of caught lightning in a bottle and won seven one-score games. Uh, How are you and your teammates able to be so successful in so many pressure situations? I think we, I mean, we won ugly, man. Offensively, and, I mean, bluntly, we had a great defense. I mean, any team that has Shane Conlon and DJ Dozier on it, I mean, you're going to win a lot of football games, right? And if you look at our defense, you look at our defensive coaches, I mean, there wasn't a weak spot on our defense. So they, I think we, as a defense, we were mature in 1985. As an offense, we were melding. We were learning. We were growing. We were making mistakes. We were, we were, you know, we didn't have the greatest passing offense in the world, but what we we were allowed to, by virtue of how good our defense was to play ourselves into being a great team. And I think it was it was that uh, that really I think the, the '85 season really prepared us to be in a position um, where 
in 86, we expected to win. And we didn't go into any team. And we played some close games and some good teams and, and you know, made some mistakes. But we didn't go into any game or, or into any fourth quarter in any game our senior year think we were going to lose that game. None. Hey, John, before I ask my next question, unlike you for that game, because a lot of people don't remember this, you will. I felt pretty good when Coach Paterno canceled the walk through the day before the game. We were in a staff meeting. He said, oh, we're ready to play. We're not going. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, we're, yeah. not, we're not going. We're ready to play. And I'm like, OK. So that was it. But one of the things what? I remember most about the 86 Fiesta Bowl was the electricity in the air before the game. In a recent interview, Shane Conlon talked about even the Super Bowls he played and did not seem as big as that game. It, it was, uh, it, I still remember, I mean, it, uh, Smitty was a captain, I was a captain, Bobby White and Shane Conlon. So we went into, we went out early to, to for the coin toss. And I still will never forget walking on the, through the end zone to the right and up the sidelines and seeing celebrities lined in the sidelines on our sidelines. We'd never seen that. Um, and it was, and it was, it was, it was electric. I mean, you're, you literally are looking around saying, Holy cow, man. These are like, do you know, Hey, who's, you know, look at that guy. That's, you know, and we had people won't remember him, but, uh, who was it? Uh, David, David, David uh, Hartman from good morning David America Hartman spent the, spent the week with us taking pictures. I still have pictures, um, after the game, uh, where he took pictures of the, of the team, uh, and and so yeah, whatever it, it was, it was a big deal. It was a big deal, and as it has been talked about, it was one versus two. It was a Friday night, still the most watched college football game. There was a lot of hype going into that game. All right, John. It only makes sense that a national championship athlete creates and molds other national championship athletes. Most Penn Staters may not know you're the proud parent of national champs as well. Tell us about the journey watching your kids play lacrosse at Duke. Uh, so, yeah, so um, all my kids were relatively athletic, thanks to my wife, Marta. Uh, <laughs> but when uh, and they all were lucky enough to play at Duke um, and uh, in in my oldest son John's first two years, he won a national championship his freshman year, and and won or was on a team that won a national championship my sophomore year, uh, and then subsequently my other my daughter played and my other two sons played. Um, they played in in a couple of Final Four games. There were a couple tournaments where they lost in the first round, which was also uh, interesting. But you know, like like any great sports experience, um, they were lucky enough to sh to have a lot of success and some failure as well. Uh, and it really, I, I think looking back, uh, it really made the nine consecutive years of Duke lacrosse uh, that, that our family experienced. Uh, it made it, you know, it made it wonderful. They're great people there. Coach Kimmel, who's the girls coach, and Coach Danowski, uh, they're just great people. Uh, they like, like my experience at Penn State, they, they mold great students. They mold great athletes. They're successful on the field, but they send people into their next journey uh, very well equipped. So, John, in 1985, there was a moment at the end of the Temple game uh, where Penn State's leading by two points and inside the five-yard line <laughs> takes a knee. Uh, and the fans booed because the point spread, I believe, was seven points. <laughs> and, and my dad said something to me afterwards, like, what are they booing about? I said, I think the spread was seven. He goes, oh, people bet on these things? Yeah. But anyway, the point is the sportsmanship was really such a part of the equation uh, then. Now, given all the taunting and posturing we see in college football, uh, do you feel like some of that sportsmanship has been lost as you watch the games now? Uh, you know, I, you know, I'm old, but I do. I think you know the Saquon Bar Barkley handing the ball to the to the, uh, to the ref after he scores. That's just class. I don't think I don't think you need to be. We just were never we were never taught that way. We had great coaches as great examples. We had great seniors when we were freshmen that you know that that led by example. If you exclude Trey Bauer from the conversation, <laughs> everybody. Yeah. Hey, I'm just you know, Todd worked with Trey a couple of years too, so he knows. Well, yeah. So it, other than if you took away those personal fouls, which were probably ninety percent of the personal fouls that we had in all four years, then yeah, we, we no. But I, but I. Uh, we were just we were just taught differently. We were taught differently, uh, and you know the business of football was scoring more points, not rubbing in anybody's faces, and walking off the field, you know, winning. Hey, John, I just did a thing with Brian Milne the other day. Remember Brian, the great fullback yeah. in '94, yeah. and every time he scored, he handed the ball to the official. So uh -huh. the one time I was laughing because he said something official, and he handed the ball, 
And I said, what do you say to him? He said, I'll be back. <laughs> so, so he, That's fantastic. But, you know, hey, before yeah. I ask this question, also remember now, I played with Chuck Fusina, so I, I have a pretty yeah. good, we spent a lot of time after practices together, but it is well known that Joe could be demanding, particularly on quarterbacks. And he was also known for his, his biting wit. Is there one thing that stands out that he said to you on the field or during the game that stands out because it was funny or because it really influenced you? Well, I will tell you, I'll just take a step back since you since you brought up uh, Chuck Fusina. I, you know, I still to this day, uh, the night before the national championship game, I think it was, uh, but we, I got a wire. I, I, that's how they sent. There were no text messages. There were no cell phones. But I got a wire from Chuck Fusina, who at the time I'd never met. Uh, but he also wore 14, uh, and you know he and Huffnagel were probably two of the best quarterbacks ever to play. Uh, you know, not I mean, including Black. I mean, Blackledge was as well, but all wore 14. So I, but I had a tremendous amount of respect for Chuck Fusina. He sent me a, a wire basically that wished me good luck. Uh, I still have. Uh, so anyway, that's that's a little aside. Um, the the one the probably the most sarcastic coach was Coach Bob <laughs> Phillips, who's not around. <laughs> Very quietly. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Got to get would, better, get what, better. <laughs> yeah, well, what he would say to you inevitably, you're out trying, right? You're not, it's not like you're you're trying to make mistakes. So you would throw an interception and he would just, you know, Joe would yell at you and he'd say, what did you see? And you try to, you know, say what you saw and it, it would always be wrong. So you just learn to not see anything. <laughs> but Bob would, would walk over and say, hey, John, did you try to throw that? You had to try to throw that interception because you know what? You, you must have tried to throw. Tell me you tried to throw that interception. You look, and you did. There's no comeback to that. So you go back in. But but Joe was pretty. Joe and I, uh, we had a re- pretty good relationship. He was. He did tell me one day that I was just like his wife. I was a stubborn German because I would argue with him. But I felt like I saw a lot more when I dropped back the pass. When he was sitting in the stands or whatever, he would say, what did you see? So I was able to remember what I saw and he would shake his head and, you know, in disgust and walk away and, you know, whatever. But it all worked out pretty well. Well, it sure did. We really appreciate the time. And I, before we let you go, I do want to ask you, because we try to educate people that are watching, whether it be, you know, when we get broadcasters, we talk about communication stuff. But as a quarterback, you watch today's game and these kids are so advanced with the seven on seven drills, throwing the ball, that type of stuff. What do you see that you like about current quarterback play, whether it's college or pro, and what are some of the things that maybe are some of the fun, the, the arts of the of the position that may be lost, John? That you'd like to see a little bit more of from current QB. We start we started to develop this from my sophomore, junior year to senior year, but nowadays quarterbacks, and maybe even in high school, but certainly at the college level and the pro level, they can they have if they're good and they're experienced, they have their playbook at their fingertips in the huddle. Once they break the huddle and once they go to the line of scrimmage, they can go a, a, a variety of different ways. We, we had some of that. We never had the breadth that, that they have now. So I think one of the really cool things now, and you talk, there's some guys that are playing in the pros now that, that live in our town that we talk about that, you know, have retired. Uh, but their ability to go up to the line of scrimmage and call whatever play they want to call or have a, a, four different things in their head and they can change it to the line of scrimmage given their, given their you know, what they see. I think is is remarkable and probably something I wouldn't have ever been able to do. <laughs> Games changed a little bit in that regard. Oh, I think yeah. I think John would have been able to handle that <laughs> mentally. <laughs> Anything else, fellas? No, nope. John. Always great to see you. Hey, John. Great to see you. Happy I can tell you this: being at Penn State. I never wanted to be the quarterback because Joe was always <laughs> with you guys, and we come off the field and go, "Thank goodness, I'm not the quarterback." Yeah, I couldn't play linebacker, so I had to play quarterback. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, John, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Enjoy your holiday. Great seeing you guys. Happy Thanksgiving.